So good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to start punctually this morning um, um, to ensure that we get both presentations in. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the first Journal Club of 2020, the year and the decade. We have two uh, wonderful uh, presentations on models of care today. And we're going to start with Dr. Izuri Wirakodi, uh, care of the elderly uh, trainee, uh, who very appropriately is going to present on a collaborative care model between geriatricians and primary care physicians um, on geriatric assessment. So with that, I'll turn it over to you at Baycrest, and I'll remind all the uh, core sites and um, individual uh, participants to mute their microphones during the presentation. Over to you. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Isiri. I'm one of the care of the elderly residents, as was just mentioned. Um, and I'm, today I'm going to be presenting on um, an article titled um, Effect of Clinical Geriatric Assessments and Collaborative medica Medication Reviews by a Geriatrician and Family Physician for Improving Health-Related Quality of Life um, in Home-Dwelling Older Adult Patients Receiving uh, Polypharmacy, published in JAMA Internal Medicine. Um, I, I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, and just to give a bit of background, um, so polypharmacy, I, I had trouble finding an exact definition of polypharmacy. Uh, some, so it includes the use of multiple medications. Um, there's no real consensus as to the number of medications. Um, this journal article decided to use seven um, as their definition. Um, and it includes the use of medications inappropriately as well. Um, and it's associated with adverse outcomes, including mortality, falls, um, adverse drug reactions, um, incre increased length of stay in hospital, um, and readmission to hospital as well. And we know um, that both in family medicine and geriatrics that harm can result from a multitude of factors, including drug-drug interactions and drug-disease interactions as well. So the, so the objective of this study was to investigate the effect of clinical geriatric assessments and collaborative medication reviews um, done uh, by geriatrician and family physician, and how this would affect the health-related quality of life um, and, other, and some other secondary outcomes in patients who live at home um, receiving polypharmacy. So a bit more about the overview of the study. Uh, it was a cluster randomized um, single blind clinical trial that took place in Norway. Um, and it was family physicians that were recruited um, from March 17, 2015 to March 16, 2017 to participate in their trial with their eligible patients. Each family physician participated with about a maximum of five patients and stratification was actually done, it was the family physician that would, that would be randomized um, to either the control group um, or the intervention group so that all those patients, all their patients would be, in the, would be in the same group. And usually they had one to two or three to five patients. The participants themselves, to be included in the study, they had to be home dwelling patients, 70 years or older and using at least seven medications regularly. And the study, um, uh, the authors hoped that this would capture some of the more frail um, elderly patients living at home. Um, and the medications were administered by home nursing service. The article doesn't go into a whole lot of detail as to what exactly was entailed in the home nursing service. Uh, but we know that the medications were, uh, weren't, uh, the patients themselves weren't administering their medications. Um, and of course, they had to be listed when, with one of the participating family doctors. Um, exclusion criteria included if they were expected to die or become permanently institutionalized within um, six months. So some of the most sick patients may not have been included. Um, if the family physician discouraged participation or if valid information was unavailable. And I actually wish that the study went into more information by what they meant by if the family physician discouraged participant participation. They don't actually mention on what criteria the family physician might discourage. Um, or for what reasons in the study they actually did, did, did discourage. Um, and they also included moderate to severe dis, uh, dementia. And uh, if they had moderate to severe dementia and they didn't have contact with a close proxy, um, at least once every second week, then they weren't eligible for the study uh, because proxy raters um, could answer the health related quality of life questionnaire as long as they were at least seen like once every two weeks. And as I mentioned, randomization occurred at the family physician level. So the intervention itself, 
uh, was, a was a clinical geriatric assessment of the patient combined with the thorough review of medications. This took about an hour long. Um, it included gather, uh, like hit, essentially a clinical geriatric assessment, like history, going through the current problems, going through the medication list, doing a physical exam. Um, and assessments were done by physicians trained in geriatric medicine and was supervised by a senior consultant as well. Um, then there was a targeted meeting between the geriatrician and the family physician with discussion of each medication, the plan and the follow-up. And this approximately took about 15 minutes. And then there was clinical follow-up generally done by the, by the family doctor. So the primary outcomes included, uh, the, primary, the primary outcome was um, the health-related quality of life, which is this 15-dimension uh, instrument. That and the primary outcome itself was at 16 weeks, but they also looked at 24 weeks as well. Um, and the 15-dimension um, instrument is supposed to be kind of, um, it's supposed to encompass different, uh, different areas um, of importance, including like mobility, vision, hearing, breathing, like depression, there are usual activities. Um, so it, it's supposed to be um, quite thorough. And then they used an analysis of covariance model um, for their statistics. So just to give an idea of what the questionnaire actually looks like, this is one of the questions for mobility. So the patient is, is kind of giving their subjective report or a proxy. So I'm able to walk normally without difficulty indoors and outdoors. And on stairs, I'm able to walk without difficulty indoors, uh, but, but outdoors and or on stairs, I have slight difficulties. So this is just to give an idea of what the questionnaire actually looks like. Um, the secondary outcomes, there were a whole host of secondary outcomes uh, that included orthostatic blood pressure, falls, weight, hospital admissions, the number of the, the days the patient spent in his own home during follow-up, um, so several, several different secondary outcomes, um, appropriateness of drug regimens, um, and uh, some several cognitive testing as well, including trail-making test A, trail-making test B, um, the five digits test. Uh, so with regards to uh, the results of the study, so the primary outcome that they were looking at was the health-related quality of life. Um, looking at this, uh, looking at this 15 dimen dimension score instrument, um, and as you can see, the health-related quality of life did increase, decrease. It did go down in both groups. Um, and this may be because I would be interested to hear what everyone else thinks as well, but this may be because this was a more sicker, older population. Um, they had medications administered by the home nur nursing service. So that may be why they both, they both decreased. However, in the intervention group, uh, the decrease was less than in the control group. And at week 16, which was their primary outcome, the estimated group difference was 0 0.05 with a p-value of 0 0.03. And at week, uh, so it was significant. Um, and at week 24, the estimated group difference was 0 0.052 with a peak value of 0 0.06. However, when they controlled for dementia, because um, when they initially postulated what covariates might have an influence um, on health-related quality of life, they came up with a, they came up with a few like um, age, um, sex, uh, like disability, dementia. And when they looked at that, uh, dementia was the only one factor that actually had an effect on randomization. So they controlled for dementia. And when they controlled for dementia um, at week 16, the group difference was 0 0.055 with a p-value of 0 0.01. And when control for dementia week 24, the group difference was 0 0.064 with a p-value of 0 0.02. So it was significant at both um, 16 weeks and at 24 weeks as well. So with regards to the secondary outcomes, it's actually almost a bit unclear in the study what was what was um, significant and what wasn't significant because they talk about like in the discussion they go back and forth between like this was not significant but they don't actually end up mentioning what was significant um, and and there's also no p-values that are shown for the secondary outcomes as well so it's, it's almost a bit unclear but we can see that for example the medication appropriateness index um, did improve with the intervention at 16 at 16 weeks and we also see that the short physical, short physical performance battery scale, it actually got worse with the intervention. Gait speed increased with the intervention. Grip strength increased with the intervention at 16 weeks. Digit span forward, 
um, increase, digit span backward increase, tail making test A, the time actually decreased in the intervention group, which is good. Trail making test B, the time decreased in the intervention, good, uh, in the intervention, which again, as I mentioned, is good. Same thing with the five digit um, test one, test two, uh, test three, um, as well as test four as well. And then the functional independence uh, measure, um, the functional independence, uh, functional independence, indep sorry, the functional independence measure actually, um, that one, that one actually, I think, it, what, that one uh, decreased in the intervention group and the relative stress scale increased in the intervention group, which is not good. So like I said, they don't mention what's, what's significant and what's, uh, what is not significant very clearly. So it is a little bit confusing because the article results section mentions like there was no statistically significant difference between groups regarding orthostatic blood pressure, relative stress and disability, but they don't actually talk about what the other ones. Um, so it's a bit unclear, especially because the p-values are not shown either. And then same thing for these other secondary outcomes as well that we have listed now. It's the, uh, the, again, they don't show any p-values, so it's a bit unclear. Uh, but as essentially, the as assessment of underutilization improved in the intervention group, which, which, which was good. Um, falls decreased in the intervention group. The hospital admissions actually increased in the intervention group. So more people were admitted to hospital in the intervention group. And then admission to permanent institutionalized care decreased and mortality mortality decreased as well. And then same thing with the use of the home nursing service, it decreased in the intervention group and time spent at home increased in the intervention group as well. So there were a lot of, so there were a lot of things uh, that were positive, but again, as I said, because there's no p-values, I'm not sure if the results were significant or not. Again, they do mention in the article results, sec uh, results section that hospital admissions being higher in the intervention group was not statistically significant. So it's just a bit confusing what they decide to explain as being statistically significant or not and what they kind of leave out. And it's very similar in the secondary outcomes here. They talk about there were more drug withdrawals, reduced dosages, and new drug regimens started in the intervention group in the period from baseline to week 16 which again is, is pretty clear, we, 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 do, we do see that, the total number of drug changes was much higher in the intervention group than in the control group. And then they say, but there was no statistically significant difference between groups in the period from week 16 to week 24. So again, it's a bit unclear to me because they mentioned week 16 to week 24 wasn't statistically significant, but they don't, they don't explicitly mention if that one from baseline to week, week 16 was statistically significant or not. However, um, at week 16, only one of 84 patients in the intervention group had not experienced any drug changes at all compared with 28 of 79 patients in the control group. So I already talked about, I think, some of the, some of the weaknesses and the positives of the study, but going a little bit, going a bit further. Um, so was the assignment of patients, patients to treatment randomized? Um, so as I mentioned, cluster randomization occurred at the family physician level, and each family physician participated with a maximum of five patients, and stratification was performed uh, based on the number of contributing patients, so usually it was about one to two versus three to five, and randomization was computer generated and carried out in blocks of unknown and variable size, and a statistician um, who was not involved in the rest of the study prepared the, all prepared the allocation sequence. Um, and then were the groups similar at the start of the trial? So by first look, you know, it looks like all, it looks like the participants were similar between intervention and control. Like by age, they look quite similar. Um, females, you know, the intervention group uh, had about 50-50. Um, the control group had, uh, had more women. But again, what's kind of, uh, but the issue is that there are no p-values to know if there was actually a significant difference between the intervention group and the control group to know if there was a true difference or not. So again, that's what I just mentioned here, that the characteristics between the two groups look similar, but no uh, p-value shown to determine if there were differences. However, as I mentioned before, in the secondary analysis of health-related, um, so they did a primary analysis of the outcome, and they did a secondary analysis as well of the primary outcome, which is health-related quality of life. 
In the secondary analysis, they did adjust for the covariates that a priori they thought might affect the results, so age, sex, comorbidity, dementia severity, use of the home nursing service, and hours per week. The, the only one when they randomized that they found to put, they, they found would have an effect was dementia, so they did control for dementia. Um, aside from the allocated treatment, were groups treated equally? So the control group received only usual care, but the article doesn't actually mention what usual care was. And in some ways, it may be difficult to mention what usual care is because usual care was just the regular care that would be provided by their family doctors. However, it would have been it would have been nice, I think, to know what usual care what what usual care entailed for for these uh, for these patients to at least get a get a bit of an idea. Um, so, like I said, usual care might be, it's not defined. It may be hard to define, but it, it would have been useful to know what usual care actually consisted of um, to know how it differed from the intervention. Um, were all patients who entered the trial accounted for, and were they analyzed in the groups to which they were randomized? Um, so patients who died before follow-up were registered with a score of zero, so meaning they got the worst possible health-related quality of life on the 15D instrument. Um, and if patients were lost to follow-up for other reasons than death, um, they were still included in the primary analysis, and the missing values they said were handled with this multiple imputation model. That sounds a little bit too fancy for me to understand, but essentially everyone was included um, that was in the study. For the, and for the primary outcome, there were more people that died um, in the control group compared to the intervention group. But when they, when they control for that, the, the results were still significant, though. So even when they took out all the people who, who died, um, the results were still significant, which they did in their linear model. Um, and with regards to the secondary outcomes, um, patients lost to follow-up were not imputed for, and results on secondary outcomes are based on patients still participating in the study. Um, and they said that was because for some of the secondary outcomes, when they put the, re the lowest result possible, it just didn't, it didn't make sense. Like for example, for the, like the caregiver stress scores, um, after the patient passed away, then the, the caregivers would look like much more stressed than they had been before. So that's why for the secondary outcomes, they actually ended up taking away the people that were lost, to, uh, taking out the people that were lost to follow up. Um, were measures objective or were the patients and clinicians kept blind to which treatment was being received? So the research assistants were the, were the ones who visited the patients at baseline at 16 weeks and at 24 weeks. Um, and, and, and the injury was administered uh, by them. Um, so the research assistants were kept blind, but however, the control group receiving usual care from their, family, from their family doctors during the study period would know which arm they were in, the control group and the intervention group, and physicians participating would also know which arm they were in. It would be impossible for them not to know. Um, so how precise were the risk estimates or confidence intervals? So as I mentioned, three analyses were done for the primary outcome. The three analyses were the first one was the ANCOA without controlling for any covariate. The second analysis was controlling for dementia. And then the third one, they also did a linear model, which showed very similar results. So I just focused on the ANCOA one for this, uh, for this slide. Um, with regards to uh, the ANCOA, at week 16, when they did the estimated group difference, as I mentioned before, it was 0 0.045 with a confidence interval of 0 0.004 to 0 0.086. And when they did their secondary analysis, um, controlling for the covariate dementia, the between group difference was 0 0.055 um, and the confidence interval was 0 0.014 um, to 0 0.096, which is uh, which is uh, which is uh, small, and then the uh, the p value was um, significant at 0 0.01. Um, so, with regards to what the clinical significance and bottom line, um, so their their objective was to determine if these uh, if these clinical geriatric assessments um, done in collaboration with the family physician would improve the health related quality of life. Um, and clinical geriatric assessments and collaborative medication reviews carried out by a geriatrician in cooperation with the patient's family physician shows it may have a positive effect on the health-related quality of life in patients who live at home who are getting polypharmacy. Um, I think the other question, though, is will the results help me in caring for my patient? Um, and I think yes and no, and I would be interested in hearing what everyone else thinks as well. I think the patients are similar 
to patients that we often see. They're older, over 70. They're on multiple medications. They need help getting their medications uh, um, ad administered. Um, again, I wish there was more, there was, uh, more information with regards to um, the, pa the patient characteristics um, itself, like exactly like how many comorbidities they had. Um, and I think health-related quality of life may be an in important outcome to focus on in that uh, the, the, the questionnaire was kind of did encompass, all, I think, a lot of different areas that are important to our patients, um, including like mood, their vision, their hearing. Um, so, so it's, a, it, and, I, and, it's, and, it's, and it's measured by like the perception of the patients itself, which is an important outcome to us, right? At the end of the day, you know, we can have all these objective outcomes such as falls, orthostatic blood pressure, disability, but the health related quality of life is being captured from the perspective of the patient. So in that sense, it is an important outcome. Um, but at the same time, I think the study had some important um, limitations as well in that it was quite um, it, it did it was quite a time consuming study um, in that there was involvement of um, it's an involvement of a, a, a physician that was trained in geriatrics but there was also a specialized consultant that was reviewing as well there was also a, a pharmacist um, that was involved as well in answering in actually looking through the medications um, and, uh, and, and completing the under, under utilization questionnaires and the medication appropriate, appropriateness questionnaire. And then there was also the family physician as well. So, I mean, ideal world, that's great, but we know that there are time related limitations with that. Um, there's also close cooperation between the geriatrician and the family physician that may not always be possible. And as I mentioned, the assessments were done by a physician trained in geriatric medicine and also supervised by a senior consultant as well. Um, in addition, I think it's important to note that there were many hospitalizations in the intervention group as well, even though this wasn't statistically significant. So it almost makes us wonder uh, whether maybe the intervention had been had been too had been too aggressive, um, and that's something for us to keep in mind in our own in our own practice um, in our own practice as well. Um, and then the last thing I think is that with regards to a lot of outcomes that we consider to be important, such as falls, orthostatic blood pressure, disability, use of home nursing service, mortality, um, a lot of these outcomes, there was no, there was no actual si significant difference, right? So I think it's important to consider um, the cost versus um, benefit and, and maybe uh, in consideration with all the time limitations, maybe e-consults would be sort of an answer would be, would be kind of an answer um, to how to address some of these time limitations, I think, um, that were there um, in this study. And so with that, thank you very much, Dr. Wirakoti, for your presentation. For the interest of time, we will move on uh, to Dr. Dmitry Petrov, also going to be presenting on a model of care. Dr. Petrov is a PGY4 Geriatric Medicine Subspecialty uh, Resident and presenting from Mount Sinai uh, this morning. Good morning, I'm uh, uh, Dmitry Petrov, uh, APG4 in Geriatric Medicine. And thank you so much for uh, the introduction, Dr. Gandel. Uh, so today um, I would like to talk about uh, uh, the study that looked at the effects of geriatric interdisciplinary home rehabilitation on complications in readmissions after hip fracture, which was a randomized control trial. Um, sorry, how do I switch sides? Oh, there. So I have uh, no conflicts of interest. Uh, today, my objectives uh, are to review the evidence for hip fracture care among elderly adults. Uh, then we'll uh, review the study's methods and results and uh, um, the next uh, objective of mine is to provide critical appraisal of the study and facilitate discussion about uh, this study's implications. Uh, so for a bit of background, we all know that hip fracture is a catastrophic acute event that can result in serious morbidity and mortality. Uh, unfortunately, it oftentimes serves as a sentinel event uh, and leads to approximately 20% of the people dying within the, first, uh, within the year of uh, having a uh, hip fracture. Uh, the risk of mortality is higher for men, uh, it increases with advancing age, and it also is higher for those living in nursing homes, um, because uh, understandably uh, 
patients in nursing homes oftentimes are much sicker than community dwelling adults. Um, among people previously independent in mobility, only about uh, half of them uh, are able to walk unaided following a hip fracture. Uh, and uh, this leads to about a fifth of all patients uh, presenting with a hip fracture uh, with needing long-term care placement. Uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, good and strong evidence behind uh, acute inpatient care for older adults who come in with hip fractures. Uh, there were studies uh, that showed uh, uh, surgery within the first 48 hours is, was associated with decreased risk of mortality. The multimodal and analgesia uh, provides better pain relief with less side effects, and that's usually because of less opioid use. Um, fascia iliaca block has been shown to reduce incidence of delirium, which is uh, a very serious complication postoperatively. Uh, and inpatient comprehensive geriatric assessment was also studied and it showed improved mortality and reduced complications. And all of these are reflected in the uh, Canadian guidelines developed by Bone and Joint Canada as well as the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence guidelines out of the United Kingdom. However, when it comes to post-acute care recommendations, uh, the evidence is not as strong. So the current recommendations uh, um, state that all hip fracture patients, including patients admitted from long-term care and patients with dementia, uh, should receive an active rehabilitation program. Um, and it also uh, focuses on uh, the fact that uh, hip fracture patients who are medically stable, who are cognitively intact and are able to mobilize should receive uh, early supportive discharge and community-based rehabilitation program, which unfortunately does not capture um, a lot of our patients. Uh, and the guidelines acknowledge that further work should be conducted to define criteria for the appropriate post-acute care setting. Uh, in terms of the optimal intensity and key components of re re rehabilitation, there are also currently no recommendations uh, due to insufficient uh, evidence. Uh, in general, uh, the recommendations note that uh, uh, the post-acute care rehabilitation needs to be uh, a, a multidisciplinary approach and address uh, key elements, uh, most or all, all of which actually are being addressed in the comprehensive geriatric assessment that we do for all of our patients. And there were a few um, Cochrane reviews that uh, addressed uh, this research. There's a Cochrane review uh, done in 2008, which looked at uh, post-acute uh, care setting for rehabilitation, looking at uh, care at the home versus hospital uh, versus own home environment. Uh, they uh, looked at uh, 8,300 um, uh, studies, uh, of which they uh, selected 56 studies and five reviews. Um, and unfortunately, none of those actually met the inclusion criteria. Um, and because of their poor quality. And uh, among the different reasons for not meeting the inclusion criteria, uh, these studies either um, had the description of the environment uh, not clearly defined, or the components of rehabilitation was not clearly specified, or the control and intervention sites were not comparable uh, with respect to methodological criteria set out by the Cochrane group. There was a subsequent Cochrane review done in 2015, which focused specifically on the evidence of enhanced rehabilitation and care models for adults with dementia. Uh, and they also were looking for randomized and quasi-randomized clinical trials. Uh, they were able to include five trials with a total of 316 participants. Uh, four of these trials evaluated models of enhanced uh, interdisciplinary rehabilitation and one trial compared the geriatric group led inpatient versus orthopedic team care. And all of these five studies uh, were actually uh, subgroup analyses uh, of patients with dementia uh, taken out of larger randomized control trials. Uh, and again, unfortunately, the quality of all of these trials was low or very low. Uh, 
due to high risk of bias in uh, more than one domain. The Cochrane Review authors commented on the fact that a lot of these trials, um, due to having a small um, study size, uh, did not have enough power to detect differences between the intervention groups. Uh, and they also noted that uh, some of these uh, five trials had uh, significant dif baseline differences uh, between the, um, the control um, versus the intervention. Um, so inter interestingly, there is actually another um, uh, post-acute care rehabilitation model, which we don't uh, frequently see here in Ontario, and that's the home-based multidisciplinary multidisciplinary rehabilitation model. Uh, and these kind of models focus on the geriatrician, the occupational physical therapist actually going out to the patient's home to provide rehabilitation in the home environment. Uh, so this study looked at the evidence um, behind this uh, model of care. It was a review article which was published in 2013. Uh, and uh, it uh, tried to also identify randomized control trials um, that uh, looked into this uh, care model. They identified uh, almost 3,000 articles of which they were able to uh, select five articles which met their inclusion criteria. Uh, two of those were conducted in Sweden, two in Australia, and one in Hong Kong. And uh, one study was a comparator study in the inpatient setting uh, versus uh, like inpatient setting versus home. And the other ones were uh, home rehabilitation uh, rehab uh, versus uh, no treatment. Uh, and so these uh, studies did actually show uh, that um, there was uh, greater improvement in balance uh, confidence, functional status, as well as the lower extremity uh, strength when compared to uh, um, when they were comparing the home-based uh, rehabilitation versus no treatment. Uh, but again, uh, these uh, trials had a lot of limitations um, and uh, they also did not really address any patients with uh, dementia or uh, patients who are, are coming from long-term long care, uh, which uh, uh, is a large uh, uh, population, a subgroup that, of our patients that we care for. Um, and that brings us to the study that I want to discuss today. Uh, it was published uh, in uh, uh, January 2000, uh, in August 2018, in the clinical rehabilitation. And this was a randomized control trial um, looking at the effects of uh, geriatric uh, home rehabilitation on complications in readmissions after hip fracture. So the study objective was to evaluate if geriatric and interdisciplinary Home rehabilitation reduced the number of complications, uh, readmissions, and total days spent in hospital after discharge during a 12-month period compared to usual care. Uh, it was a single-blind, uh, uh, single-center randomized control trial uh, undertaking at the geriatric department uh, at uh, the Ume University Hospital in Sweden. Uh, as well as at patients' homes. And this was a uh, intention to treat trial. All the patients were 70 years and older, and they did actually include those with cognitive impairment or dementia, as well as those who were admitted from uh, residential care facilities. And uh, the patients were randomized from May 2008 to June 2011, and they were followed for 12 months. So their uh, inclusion criteria were um, the age uh, of, the per of the patient needed to be 70 or uh, greater. Uh, they needed to come in with an acute hip fracture and they looked specifically at cervical or trochanteric fractures. Mm -hmm. uh, they needed to live in the specific municipality of Yume uh, and they did also include patients with cognitive impairments uh, and dementia. The exclusion criteria were 
um, either having pathologic fractures or the fracture occurring in the hospital setting, uh, or if the patients actually lived outside of their municipality. Uh, so in the study, all the patients were initially admitted to the orthopedic department before the surgery, but immediately after surgery, all the cervical fractures were uh, transferred to the geriatric department ward for rehabilitation. Uh, and the trochanteric fractures, they actually returned to the orthopedic department, and they were only included in the, this trial if they actually needed to be transferred to the geriatric ward if they were deemed to require more uh, rehabilitation. Uh, the uh, randomization uh, to intervention con control groups occurred prior to the arrival uh, of the patient to the ward, and they were actually sent to different hospital wings. Um, all the assessments were done by two researchers within five days of admission, and then also at three to 12 months postoperatively. And these researchers were blinded, and in the hospital, the assessments took place in a neutral room so that they would not know um, which, uh, which arm the patient uh, was part of. Uh, so the control group uh, was a multifactorial rehabilitation program a aimed to detect, prevent, and treat uh, various complications, including delirium, pain, falls, uh, malnutrition, as well as decubitus ulcers. Uh, so this was um, like an inpatient rehabilitation program where the uh, most responsible physician was a geriatrician. Uh, and the team also included occupational therapists and physiotherapists who worked with the patients um, to uh, reach their rehabilitation goals. Uh, and then uh, upon discharge, if it was felt that the patient still needed additional rehabilitation, then they were referred to primary care who would then be able to uh, send a referral to outpatient rehab uh, for these patients uh, with the caveat that they wouldn't be able to start this rehabilitation um, uh, for the first three months after discharge. And the intervention group um, initially had the same uh, treatment. So they were also included in the multifactorial rehabilitation program. Um, led by a geriatrician, they all received a comprehensive geriatric assessment and they were uh, cared uh, for by the occupational and physical therapists. However, the difference in the intervention group was that the focus was on early discharge uh, back to home or back to long-term care facility uh, to continue rehabilitation uh, in that setting. Uh, the discharge criteria were that there needed to be no medical obstacles to discharge uh, that the patient could manage basic transfers and that all the uh, patient needs were, uh, could be met at home. And, and once they were discharged, then they were uh, met by the geriatric interdisciplinary home rehabilitation team, uh, which consisted of a nurse, an occupational therapist, two phys physiotherapists, as well as a geriatrician. And then at the discretion of the geriatrician or the nurse, uh, the social worker and the dietitian could be consulted as well. Uh, and initially, after discharge, these patients uh, were visited nearly every day, but then uh, each of them had an individualized rehabilitation program set in place with different uh, visit frequency, uh, and the maximum duration of this rehabilitation was 10 weeks. Uh, again, at the end of the 10 weeks, if there still felt to be a need for rehabilitation, then a, a referral to primary care was made at that point. Uh, so all the baseline assessments were done on admission to the hospital, and they included uh, a baseline heart disease assessment and an anesthesiologist assessment using the American, Social, uh, American Society of Anesthesiologists classification. All the uh, activities of daily living were um, assessed using the CATS ADL index, which is a validated tool. Uh, the drug prescriptions were only recorded as yes or no, and uh, the dose of the medications was not recorded. Uh, and length of stay was measured from admission 
uh, to the actual geriatric ward uh, until discharge. So these were all the study outcomes that the researchers were interested in. They were interested in uh, infections, cardiovascular events, decubitus ulcers, falls, uh, delirium, mortality, as well as additional fractures and reoperations. Uh, they also separately looked at the amount of readmissions and length of stay of those admissions um, and looked at total days uh, spent at hospital between the groups. Um, so the data was collected by a non-blinded geriatrician. All the infections were divided into four groups. Uh, the infections uh, in the uh, chest, in the thoracic region, urinary tract infections, as well as superficial and deep wound infections. Uh, myocardial infarction and heart failure were counted separately as cardiovascular events, uh, but they they were both um, then uh, included uh, um, um, in the uh, analysis. Uh, and uh, patients who had heart failure at baseline and had an heart failure exacerbation, those were also counted as, uh, as heart failure complications. In terms of falls, so they counted, uh, looked at incidents on, of falls and uh, they were looking at uh, when patients unintentionally came to rest on floor or ground. The way that they collected this information was by uh, asking uh, the patients or if the patient had cognitive impairment or dementia, then they would ask the next of kin or the caregiver. Uh, and then they also used a binary logistic model to calculate the odds ratios of falling. And uh, the correlation between covariance was tested using the Pearson's and Spearman's coefficient. Uh, they ended up doing a regression analysis to adjust for age, gender, observation time, as well as baseline difference. Uh, when they're assessing for delirium, they use the organic brain syndrome scale, which is also a validated uh, tool uh, used for that, as well as the mini mental status exam. Uh, however, um, a blinded geriatrician was then looking at the results of these uh, uh, two assessments to then determine if the DSM-4 criteria were met for the diagnosis of, uh, of delirium. And so they started off with 466 patients uh, that were screened for eligibility. Uh, 257 of them were excluded, majority of the reason uh, of which were because of uh, uh, just not being in the, in the geographic municipality. And then uh, 37 declined to participate and 33 were missing due to failure of the inclusion routine. Uh, so the, they took the 209 patients uh, and split them in the, into the two groups um, and ended up with 107 in the geriatric uh, interdisciplinary home rehab group and 98 in the control arm. Uh, of those uh, 95, uh, of the 107 patients in the geriatric uh, home re rehabilitation group, 95 ended up having all the data um, at 12 months follow-up. Uh, and this was because of uh, some missing patients, uh, either who, who were either lost to follow up uh, or have uh, withdrawn their consent. Uh, it is actually interesting, they don't mention it at this point, but later on in the discussion, they also mentioned that uh, six of the patients that were meant to receive the uh, home rehabilitation intervention ended up never receiving it. Um, Five of those patients were in the hospital due to other uh, complications and then on discharge were not deemed to require rehabilitation and then one patient was missing. And then of the 98 uh, who were included in the conventional geriatric care group, uh, 89 of those patients had available data at 12 months. Uh, and this again was either due to missed patients uh, or due to uh, patients who withdrew their consent. Uh, this is table one looking at the baseline characteristics and uh, what I'd like to uh, direct your attention to um, are the, the following uh, few um, characteristics. So all of them uh, uh, were actually uh, 
uh, fairly old with a mean age of 82.9. Uh, there were more females than males uh, in this study. Uh, and uh, it looks uh, like uh, a third of them actually came from long-term care facilities. And then if you look at dementia, 50% uh, of all the uh, participants had dementia, which is uh, quite a significant number. And of the uh, patients included in the study, 58% uh, of them had three or more comorbidities. Um, what was interesting as well is that actually there were three things which were statistically different between the intervention and the control groups, and those were the medications at discharge, including analgesics, antidepressants, and Parkinson medications. Uh, everything uh, else, all the other characteristics um, were not statistically significant. Uh, so these are all the complications uh, that the researchers were interested in. Um, and none of the uh, complications actually, there was no significant difference, uh, no statistical, uh, statistically significant difference in any of the complications. Uh, but I would like to point out a few interesting things. Uh, it looked to me that there was uh, quite a, a higher amount of falls in the intervention group compared to the control group, even though there was no statistical difference. Uh, and this also resulted in a higher amount of uh, fractures uh, in the intervention group. And then the intervention group also had uh, as more, uh, more patients with delirium uh, compared to the control, but again, this did not meet statistical significance. And then if you look at the length of stay, um, the average amount of days uh, spent in the, uh, during the initial admission was 17 for the intervention group and 23 for the control group. So there was a six day difference, which was statistically significant. Uh, but then if you also look at the uh, total number of days spent in hospital after discharge, again, if, even though it's not statistically significant, um, the amount of days uh, spent in a hospital in the intervention group was uh, higher than the control group, being 218 versus 140 days. And they also had slightly higher amount of uh, readmissions. So uh, moving on to critical appraisal. Uh, so are the results of the trial valid? Um, was the assignment of patients to treatment randomized? And uh, yes, it was randomized. It was randomized by nurse on duty by selecting an envelope containing a concealed sequentially numbered lot before each patient arrived to the ward. Uh, but there may have been a selection bias in the group of trachinteric factors uh, because only those who actually required rehabilitation were included uh, in this trial. And this may affect the ex external validity uh, of the study. Uh, in terms of uh, similarity of the groups uh, at the start of the trial, there was actually a significant baseline difference in the use of uh, antidepressants, analgesic, and Parkinson medications. Um, aside from allocated uh, treatment, were groups treated equally? And I think the answer to this uh, is yes. They were treated, they had the same treatment prior to the intervention taking place. Uh, the outcomes were followed in the same way. Uh, however, the war staff were not blinded to group allocation, which may have influenced the length of stay. Uh, and uh, the home rehabilitation group, uh, the geriatrician may have detected more complications at patients' homes, uh, which may have contributed to information bias. Um, in terms of... Uh, uh, were, there, were all patients accounted for. Um, this was an intention to treat trial, but they do have some uh, missed patients. Uh, four patients withdrew consent, three were lost to follow-up and one moved to a different town. And then they also uh, mentioned that there were seven patients who uh, were randomized to the intervention group who actually never received the intervention. And this was either because they stayed in a hospital uh, and then on discharge did not require rehabilitation and one uh, patient was missed. 
um, was there blinding and were the measures objective? Uh, the outcome assessment was done by blind, blinded investigators. Uh, majority of measures were objective, um, uh, which uh, is, uh, is one of the uh, strengths of the study. And uh, however, the number of falls may be underestimated because the collection of the data was based on recall. And 50% uh, of the patients in the study actually had cognitive impairment um, and, or, and or dementia. Um, how large was the treatment effect? Well, they showed uh, that there was no difference uh, between the number of complications, hospitalizations, or total days spent in hospital. Uh, so, uh, is my patient similar to the study patients? And I think the answer to this is yes, because uh, the patients included in this study were uh, quite old. Um, a lot of them had dementia, and a third of them uh, were living in a long-term care facility. Uh, and a lot of them had multiple comorbidities. So, we, I find that uh, these patients represent the, the typical patients that we would uh, care for. Um, is this feasible? Well, this uh, kind of intervention is currently not uh, routinely done in Ontario. Uh, and do the potential benefits outweigh the harms? Um, the study showed no difference in amount of complications, but they did not report on a few important uh, outcomes, such as uh, quality of life of the patients and cost effectiveness of uh, this intervention. So I think the strengths are that it was a randomized intention to trial. The outcomes were assessed by blinded researchers and the data collection was done systematically. They included patients with cognitive impairments as well as those living in long-term care facilities. And they did regression analysis to account for differences at baseline. In terms of weaknesses, the, uh, this was a small study in size which limited its statistical power to uh, detect differences in complications, um, statistical dif difference in, in, in number of complications. There, there may have been a selection bias in the trochanteric fracture group. The randomization was not completely successful because there were baseline differences. Uh, the ward staff was not blinded, which may have affected the length of stay, um, which was one of the only statistically significant outcomes in the study and the number of falls may have been underreported. So I think uh, bottom line is that this uh, is an interesting approach to post-care hip fracture, uh, sorry, post-acute hip fracture care with potential for improvements of the patient's quality of life because they get to go home earlier. But I feel like further large randomized controlled trials are needed to investigate the effectiveness, safety, and uh, cost of home-based uh, uh, rehabilitation. Um, thank you. These are my references. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Dimitri, for a great presentation.